in the screen up. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, did I tell you guys it was so funny? I was doing. Oh, we are. We have. We're live. Zach didn't give me. We're alive. <laughs> we are alive. It's good to be back. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody back to uh, the COVID three one three coalition for. Uh, families and students. We are really excited to be here with you today. And um, my name is Christine Bell. I am honored to serve as the executive director of UNI, um, a proud member of this coalition. And my most important job is the mom of three really wonderful, wonderful kids. So, um, you know, this town hall is, is a time where we get to hear important information, but that we also get to hear from you, that we get to ask your questions to our experts. So please put your comments or questions in the chat. Amy and Brooke are waiting for, for you. Um, eagerly waiting for you. They're super excited to be back too. And just to make sure that um, they're on their toes. Why don't you drop in the chat right now um, where you're joining us from today and, and how did you hear about the town hall? Um, like always, we're translating the town hall to Spanish and ASL. So we wanna give folks time to get on the right line and get comfortable. Ophelia, could you please give us the details on how to listen to Spanish interpretation? Thank you. Muy buenas tardes. Si quieren ver este video interpretado hacia el español, ahorita pueden ir a la página de Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation. Estamos en vivo. O esperan unos momentos y vamos a poner el enlace en el chat aquí. Este, este traducción sería hecha por la señora Gloria Rosas y yo, Ophelia Torres. Great. Thank you. It's so good to see you, Ophelia. You've been on vacation for a while, so... I have. Thank you. Yes. So welcome back. Um, we also are translating the town hall into uh, into ASL. So Julie, it's so good to see you. It's been two weeks. Um, could you please give the instructions for ASL interpretation? Thank you so much, Julie. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Stay with us for the next 60 minutes so you can stay informed and be empowered. We have a collection of experts to share their information in a variety of areas and answer some common questions. Remember, this is also a time for you to ask your questions um, to the experts. So please, please make sure you're using that Facebook chat. To ask your questions, um, again, use the Facebook chat. We'll have a question and answer se uh, session after most segments. If we can't answer your question today, we're committed to getting the answers to you by early next week. All the questions asked today will be posted with answers on OneDetroitPBS.org. For our experts, please remember to speak slowly for our translators. They want to make sure that they're translating the important information that you are sharing correctly. Also, please turn off your camera when you're not speaking to ensure that our ASL interpreter can be seen and mute yourself when you're not speaking. Terry Whitfield, our the most amazing timekeeper, uh, is with us today and he will chat you your remaining time. So keep your eye out on your chat. If you go over your time, uh, myself or Jametta, who is my co-moderator today, will gently remind you to wrap up. 
So let's get to um, our experts. Today we have really important topics that we'll be covering. The Detroit Health Department, our, some of our favorite doctors are here, Dr. Fuller and Dr. Cunningham to talk, um, to speak on the COVID variants and the vaccine and children's health and safety. We have um, Placencia uh, Mobley, and I hope that I said that correctly, the Deputy Director and Chief Engineer for the Detroit Water Department. And we have Hiba, and I don't wanna mispronounce Hiba's last name. So we have Hiba from Wayne, uh, Wayne Metro, who also has been on our show many times before. So she's gonna talk with us about the resources that Wayne Metro has for uh, um, uh, as it relates to flooding. And then we have Melanie, uh, McElroy from Michigan Voice to talk with us about voting because it is that time of year, which feels strange since it feels like we just did that in November. But we're back at it, back to back to the, our very important responsibility of voting. Um, so first up, we have Tanya from the Detroit Health Department. Welcome, Tanya. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, yeah. First. <laughs> Let's, uh, sorry, the lawn guys are mowing the grass outside, right next to my window. So if everyone can hear me, um, we can pull up the slides. The most important thing I can is just to keep up with the data for Detroit. Right now, the city of Detroit data is at 38.1% of being um, at least one vaccine. Um, are you, do you want me to share my screen or do you have the information? Thank you, awesome. Can we go to the next uh, screen, please? Thank you and thank you again for having us. Um, we still wanna keep the data in mind because we still have over 51 positive rates, um, positive cases in the Detroit area. Um, at, and it looks like our, as of yesterday, the last two days, our numbers were um, down at 1.2%, but it looks like our numbers are climbing a little bit in Michigan. So right now, as of yesterday, um, we're at 2.1. Like I said, uh, two days ago, we were at 1. Point, uh, I think it was 1.4, but we're, we're starting to climb a little bit and that's probably because of the new variants. Um, so we wanna encourage those that are not vaccinated to get vaccinated. Um, as soon as possible. Um, if we can go to the next slide, because we know that right now only 38.1% of Detroit is vaccinated and that's with at least one dose. If we look at the other numbers, Macomb, Oakland, Outer Wayne, Washtenaw um, are at least at 55, almost at 70%, but the whole state of Michigan is 56.5. Um, we have to keep that in mind. So we really encourage those that are in Detroit um, right now, if you're not vaccinated, wear your mask because we have that low number. Um, rolling to the next uh, slide, just the side effects of when you receive your COVID vaccine, just like any vaccines, I don't know how many mothers and, and dads that have taken their children to get vaccinated for anything, that side effect is going to be some pain at the sites, whether it's in your thigh or in your arm. And I'm sure you guys remember them talking about being tired, that child being tired, maybe um, a little cranky, a headache, some muscle and joint pain, and maybe some chills and nausea. Um, but that's just your immunity building itself and reacting to the vaccine. We can talk about myths, there's so many, we can roll on. Thank you very much. You do such a good job. Thank you, thank you. Um, but we're gonna keep going on and we're still in the United States only offering these three vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Those, if you look at the bottom of that screen where it says preventing death from COVID-19, those are 100% at 
preventing severe illness or deaths from COVID. That's the most important thing that, that we in the United States um, have to remember. And that's why we're using those. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna are still a two dose series. You're not fully vaccinated until 14 days after the second dose. That's always important to remember. After Johnson & Johnson, the one and done, fully vaccinated after 14 days after that one dose. And if we can keep rolling, the mask updates as of June 22nd, all fully vaccinated people, again, two weeks after your doses, you can take your mask off. You can resume without um, wearing your mask. Again, be mindful of businesses, regulations, um, whatever they're requiring you to do. Because right now we know that a lot of businesses, a lot of schools are saying you can't come back unless you have been vaccinated. Um, waivers, we have a lot of people calling for waivers. We don't have information for that just yet. Um, it's a life and death kind of um, thing going on right now. And a lot of businesses may not want to do waivers. Those that are not vaccinated are asked to wear a mask indoors to still social distance. Um, outdoors, you don't have to wear a mask. But as of June 22nd, the CDC requires Anyone that is taking public transportation, buses, trains, airplanes, as well as airports to wear masks that's vaccinated or unvaccinated. As far as being eligible for vaccines, anyone 12 years and up can receive a vaccine. We can keep rolling. Thank you. In the city of Detroit, whether you work in the city, whether you um, visit in the city, whether you're a caregiver in the city, all you have to do is call the number 313-230-0505, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, minors are required to have an adult, 18 or over, a parent or guardian to be present, to sign the consent form and to show ID. Yes, the city of Detroit does have the homebound program. We're so excited because now we can definitely take care of our residents that are at home. How do you register for that? With the same number, 313-230-0505. And also that number also, if you need help with transportation, they can help with that as well. The same number can be used for the Good Neighbor Program. You can actually take someone to get their first vaccine and you'll receive a $50 gift card or MasterCard. And you just call that number and register as a good neighbor. Um, and the Detroit Health Department has teamed up with the Detroit Public Schools I also put a flyer in um, that we'll talk about later where we'll be even right when I leave here. We're partnering up with DPS uh, on the block and we'll be at high schools, we'll be at um, all these schools here because again, schools are requiring, some schools are requiring that kids are vaccinated before they return, especially for contact sports. So this is just a list of the schools we'll be at for first doses, Renaissance High School, East English, Village Prep, uh, Munger Elementary. We wanna get our lovely people vaccinated. The Detroit Health Department is, we have plenty of locations that show up every single day. Um, we won't go through that, but just call us at that 313-230-0505. It's always important to remember with the Detroit Health Department that we um, also have mental health, depression and anxiety uh, present because of COVID. If we can keep going on. Um, and it's important that we take some self-care and think about ourselves as COVID is still here. It's still present. It's still among us. So we have to recognize and validate 
what grief we have right now. We need to connect with nature, take breaks from the news because we know that can be depressing in itself. Um, call us, we have a number and it's on our contact. If you ask a nurse line, you just call the DHD department at 313-876-4000 and option three will get you to us. We can connect you to mental health. You can talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. We're here for you because we are the community and we have to do it together. That's all I have for you today. And I thank you for allowing us to have this time to give this information because we have to work together as a team. Thank you so much. And Jametta is, we'd like you to stay, Tanya, available with your camera off um, for, for the question and answer segment that's to come. No and, um, but thank you so much. And thank you for, for raising the mental health piece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was reminded of the trauma that we all have experienced in the last year and a half and, and the triumph. But, um, but I think it's, it's thank you for, for making um, mental health services accessible for people right now because they are definitely needed. So I get to pass, uh, pa pass uh, the mic to uh, Ms. Jametta Lilly. So that is what I'm gonna do, Jametta. Thanks, Christine. Um, and always it's a joy to, to be on the program with you and is equally a joy to be able to share week after week trusted resources for our community. Um, as we all try to stay safe and sane through the reality of COVID. And, and so just like um, uh, Tanea was reminding us, we are really all in this together. But as we're in it together, uh, we really have to continue to rely on science and to rely on the people that we know have the depth and breadth of expertise, but not just expertise, but commitment and compassion for our community. And so we're always so delighted to have two uh, really outstanding positions to, to be with us during, during the segment. Uh, right now, we're really so pleased to welcome back Dr. Ovetta Fuller. Uh, Dr. Fuller is no, both uh, one of our gems uh, for research here in, at the University of Michigan, but also Dr. Fuller, you've been doing work at the national level. And so I would appreciate just for really quickly, if you could share a little bit about um, what you have done relevant to the pandemic at the national level and, and how is that informing you as you bring your expertise and uh, your lens to this work here in the Detroit area in particular? Great, um, so good afternoon to everyone and thank you again for the invitation to be part of this wonderful 313 COVID coalition. Um, you know, I always enjoy being with you guys. And um, Jametta, uh, nationally, it's just been a, a, an amazing year of um, trying to help people understand one, what COVID is and the dangers mm -hmm. it brings and how to stop it. And two, of course, with the, um, vaccine that, that vaccines that have been developed and authorized. Um, I was tapped back in August uh, to be vetted for the FDA uh, advisory committee that looks at independently looks at the data after FDA has reviewed it. So I was at the table for the emergency use authorization of all three of these vaccines. And I'm just uh, really amazed at what science has done over the course of, of this last year, using technologies that were already available, mm -hmm. but now we're put uh, to one need and that is to find a way to counteract COVID-19. And so um, it has been my, my um, privilege to help explain that to people and help the people understand mm -hmm. why the vaccine is a much needed thing and a way to for all of us to get past this pandemic that we've never seen before uh, in, in our lifetime. So it's been, a, it's, been a, um, it's been a busy time and we're not out of the pandemic. So I, I'm glad that the 313 COVID Coalition has such wonderful people as the, um, the one that just spoke from the Detroit Health Department um, explaining how easily accessible vaccines are. Uh, one thing about the vaccine is that um, there are people who've gotten it, um, as, as was mentioned 
uh, in Michigan, the numbers are in the high 50s for uh, one vaccine uh, or, or at least one dose of vaccine, but it needs to be higher. The vaccines actually prevent disease and hospitalizations. And that's, that's the really difficult part of COVID-19. That's why we, we've had so much loss. Um, the side effects are minimal um, and there's monitoring to make sure that's the case. So the, given the disease or given infection for replicating the virus versus vaccine, it's so much clearer that getting the vaccine is the way to prevent the potential. And even if people say, I, I won't get disease, I'm healthy, uh, what we're trying to do is shut down this virus. And if it replicates in anyone, then it has the potential to keep going. So we are trying to shut down the virus. Michigan is doing a great job at 2% um, of, of tests coming back positive, which is why we're open. But with the Delta variant, and let me explain what that is. Um, as viruses reproduce, their arrows that come up in their copying their genetic material. Most of those errors are not good for the virus. And so they don't, they don't, they're not lasting, they're not continued. Every once in a while, a variant will happen or a change will happen that makes the virus more fit to do what it has to do to reproduce. So that's what you hear when you hear about Great Britain or South Africa or Brazil. Now they have. Greek letters, alpha, beta, delta variants. And when a variant is better at transmitting for whatever reasons that it changed the virus's replication, then it will begin to circulate through the community faster and more efficiently, even if people aren't getting sick. So if I were to get infected, if I were unvaccinated, and even if I didn't get sick, if I was asymptomatic, and I am producing more virus and making more virus available in the community to get to those people who may get sick, those who might not be un, who may not be vaccinated, who have underlying conditions, or who just may for some reason be more susceptible to disease process from COVID, which we don't understand. And all of our children under 12 are not vaccinated. Um, there, there are hazards for children. Um, Many of them get infected with no symptoms, but more and more children are getting um, what's called multiple infl inflammatory syndrome for children, which is a long-term illness. Um, so we wanna protect those most vulnerable in our population by everybody getting vaccinated. We are not out of this, we're in a low place. If you look at other countries, you'll see that the when the Delta variant is there, that's when it finds those pockets of unvaccinated people and it causes havoc there. And we're already seeing that in some of the states that have low vaccination rates. So please get a vaccine. It doesn't matter which one. They're easy to get now. They're very accessible. If you can't get to it, you were given the numbers from the health department to call, the good neighbor program, somebody, a church, somebody will get you there. We don't want to wait till fall and look around and see that we're back in an emergency high level of, of infections and illness situation. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to be proactive and get everybody vaccinated um, so that we can avoid surge death and illness in the fall, particularly when schools reopen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fuller. Um, he, I think you highlighted some really important things in the very beginning. Uh, those drivers, data, science, and the fact that the vaccines are, are built upon technologies that already pre-existed. Yes. And I think it's also really uh, important for us to celebrate you as a Black woman being part of this process, uh, because that helps to debunk the myths that somehow this vaccine was created without having the involvement of African Americans and other people of color to assure the validity and um, the trust that, that's needed that people can get these vaccines. Uh, could you share a little bit, you, you've, you've made it really clear that people who are not vaccinated, uh, even if they are not showing symptoms, can be helping the virus to flourish, literally. Um, and that there are other communities, could you talk a moment uh, or it, it, are there some other communities that you can share with us that have had low vaccination rates and that have had these 
surges. What does that look like when people hear the word surge and, and what are the implications of that? Yes, um, so what happens is that when we have a large population, um, at least 50, 60, 70% of people vaccinated, um, it gets to a point where the people who are not are, are not, there's not as much virus in the community because it's not, there's not as much being made. Um, but if you're in a place where there's low vaccination, so um, Missouri, and I, I have the numbers in front of me, um, Missouri and, and Georgia, um, mm -hmm. uh, Florida, Texas, uh, Arkansas, these are states where there's low vaccination below 30, 33%. And so whenever, particularly when a, a virus that is more infectious, like the Delta virus, which is much, much more easy to um, transmit. I'll give you an example. If, if one person with the first virus could infect two or three or four other people before they knew they were infected, with the beta or with the alpha variant from Great Britain, it was twice that number. And now with the Delta number, it's even more. It's up like to eight to 10 people from that one person. So you can imagine that more people who are vulnerable because they're not immune, they are not vaccinated, are getting infected. And there's evidence that Delta may also be more virulent, meaning that it causes more severe symptoms, puts more people in the hospital. So what we're seeing in those states where the population vaccine level is low, actually like in Detroit, that's why we want to get the numbers up in Detroit, particularly, um, then that the, the variant just simply spreads. There are more hospitalizations. Places, again, begin to run out of ventilators. Uh, people are severely ill. So what we saw in India, for example, which has a, has, doesn't have access to the vaccine, could happen in places where there's a low vaccination level. That's why it's so important that if there's anybody you know who's not vaccinated or ask people, have you gotten your vaccine? It's so important to go get that and, in, and also to continue for me to use my mask and distancing when I'm out of my home, even though I'm fully vaccinated. And I say that because I think it's a good model for folks to re remind folks that we are not out of this pandemic. So if you look at what's going on in other states, you'll see that the numbers are rising quickly. Um, I heard some numbers yesterday about 58% now of the circulating virus in the USA is the Delta variant and it's highest in the states which are have the lowest vaccine. And in fact, the CDC suggested that 90% of the hospitalizations and even deaths that we're That's seeing right. are uh, from folks who are not vaccinated. Uh, joining us and uh, really pleased to have back with us is Dr. Cunningham from Henry Ford Health Systems, who's a pediatrician. And um, you're really under demand right now. We need to hear from you because we know that while there are uh, young people from age 12 and older getting vaccinated, uh, we've got questions. So what does what does the increase in the Delta variant mean uh, for children? What are you seeing in the ERs, et cetera, not only for children 12 plus, but for children uh, 12 and under? Dr. Cunningham, welcome. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. So the Delta variant I've been watching, and the number of cases is creeping up throughout Michigan, especially Western Michigan. Any area with low vaccination rates, we're going to see more of the Delta variant. It's causing pretty much similar to other COVID symptoms we had. Delta may be a little bit more of an upper respiratory tract infection. By that, I mean runny nose, cough, headache. Mm -hmm. uh, the vaccines are very effective against it. They're extremely effective against people who get severe disease, meaning they have to come into the hospital or even death. You can still get symptoms of breakthrough disease, a mild illness uh, with Delta, even if you're vaccinated, but it tends to be a very mild illness. So I'm just encouraging everyone who possibly can to get the vaccine. It's going to help us end this pandemic and get life back to normal. And hopefully towards the end of this summer, early fall, we'll even be able to offer the vaccine to younger children, which would be wonderful. Yeah, to say the least. So we, we know that children are going back to school and children are around each other so much more now during the summer. Uh, how do parents, how do parents 
better understand the distinction between the typical runny nose, ear infections and things that children have versus that they may in fact um, be having some symptoms of, of COVID. What are you suggesting around testing if a child has not, uh, is not old enough yet for a vaccine? So when I'm seeing patients in my clinic, if they have cold symptoms, I am testing them for COVID. It's a quick swab in the nose. I can get the results back in under 24 hours, and then we know for sure what we're dealing with. I think it's important to do that testing. I think it's also important if your child has a cold, have them stay home. Don't send them out to other people. We really don't want to spread this any more than it's already spreading. And just some common sense. If you're sick, try to isolate, but don't hesitate to call your doctor. It's easy, easy, easy to get tested. Yes. So what about parents now that finally, um, you know, now that child care is recognized for being an essential service that it's need and child care centers are opening, schools are opening, what would you suggest to parents or even Dr. Fuller when, when a parent is trying to understand what are the policies that would keep their child safe, what are the types of questions or things that you think parents should be mindful of for their uh, infant toddler or preschool centers as well as schools? Well, one thing you could certainly ask are the people working these daycares vaccinated. That would make me feel better, even though the children can't get it. The employees caring for the children certainly can. Again, important that we don't let sick people go to daycare or child care or school. We need to make sure that people don't have COVID before they go into general populations where it can spread things. Washing your hands a lot, either with soap and water or one of the alcohol-based gel rubs is perfectly good. And lastly, when kids are eligible for the vaccine, I'm a big believer in the vaccine. My teenagers already received it. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, Dr. Fuller? Just really quickly, I know we got to wrap up our segment, but there are parents who have children that are younger. I, I even think about my own grands. I was just with them. They're nine years old uh, and lots of other folks who, whose parents are waiting. Uh, what is that timeline looking like for uh, when there will be approval for vaccines that are for children under the age of 12? Yes, that's a big concern um, uh, in terms of the children under 12 <clears throat> who are not eligible now. Um, those studies are underway and uh, the, the VRPAC uh, committee or advisory group did meet to discuss what would be needed. And there's some of us that urge that whatever we could do to expedite that process, mm -hmm. Uh, of making sure the vaccine amounts and are, are adjusted for children under 12, particularly six and over, um, mm -hmm. will probably come on board sooner than those five and under uh, who are in their younger years. So um, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime in the next couple months uh, because those studies are in progress and it is really important yes. to get the doses mm -hmm. right and to make mm -hmm. sure that we understand what happens. But believe me, there's a lot of uh, push to get that done so that parents can feel that they can have a means to protect their children. Mm -hmm. The vaccines are wonderfully protective against severe disease and hospitalizations and death. And that's the problem with COVID. We wanna make it, uh, uh, if, it, if, it if, it's, if we have to coexist with COVID, we want it to be like any other upper respiratory infection, common cold, um, not even like the flu, but more like the common colds. And so that's what the vaccine does for us. Our task is to get as many people as possible vaccinated who are eligible now, 12 and older. Um, and then when the others come on board and their safety and uh, levels are adjusted to include the, our children so we can live with this virus and this disease. Yeah, thank you. And, and re, it, that helps people to remember that we used to have diseases like polio, diphtheria, a malaria that killed thousands, if not millions over periods of time. And through science, through science um, and immunizations, i.e. vaccinations, we changed that. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, one last question for you. Uh, Henry Ford is now mandating the vaccine for its employees. Can you share what was the thinking that's gone into that decision? So there were a few reasons why we made that decision. The first is we believe we have we have to lead by example. And if we're recommending vaccines, we should be willing to get the vaccine as well. So we're following the science. 
it's another layer of protection when we have patients come in. We do have patients who may not respond well to the vaccine. Perhaps they have cancer or their immune system doesn't work because of a medicine. So it's another layer of protection. And then looking globally at the population, the only way we're going to get this under control is by widespread vaccination. Uh, the variants arise in unvaccinated groups, not vaccinated people. So we felt this was an important contribution to helping the whole state and country get out of this mess. Thank you. It is always a good idea for all of us to lead by example. So we're certainly, all of us at the COVID-313 town halls, uh, we have been consistent in saying uh, the vaccination immunization is an important part of our health and wellness and encouraging people to do so. And in fact, viewers are going to see many more uh, corporations, businesses, nonprofits, churches saying, you know, we've got to protect ourselves and our community by becoming vaccinated. Uh, Dr. Fuller and Dr. Cunningham, thank you so much. Um, I want to, we, we're getting ready to move into the next segment, but I want to pause for a quick moment. If we have any questions, Christine. Do we have one question? Why do the vaccines only have emergency approval when they have been given millions of times without incident? What makes people, that, that makes people, that makes many people hesitant to receive them. So why are the vaccines still in this emergency approval phase, um, even though they've been given now to millions of people? Yes, so-, so When you look at the regulations, it's usually you are under emergency use authorization for six months, and then you transition to full approval. Moderna and Pfizer did submit their data to the FDA requesting the full approval. I expect that to happen any time in the next few weeks. I was about to open my mouth and say that. Um, so, so we're under EUA because uh, of the need was urgent in December and that was the most ex, uh, expedient way to get it to people. Um, we are, are put on notice uh, of dates reserved where there may be upcoming meetings. One, to look at the youth data, as well as uh, I think both, both companies are seeking licensing, um, and that requires a process. So um, I think we've had it in a lot of people, and, and you know we'll, we'll have to wait and see what the licensing data look like, but I believe the goal is to get it licensed. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. you. Um, an important segment as always. And uh, while we're talking health, uh, we've had another health crisis that literally kind of came out of the blue for many of us in uh, the Detroit area. And that was the phenomenal amount of rain that we had that created uh, very much an unprecedented level of flooding in the city as well as some other areas, but particularly throughout the city of Detroit and wreaked havoc with not only residents, but, but also some businesses. And unfortunately, some communities more than others. So of course, uh, we wanna be able to bring on partners from the city of Detroit who have the expertise to help us understand and ask some questions. And so really pleased to have Palencia Mobley uh, joining us. Palencia is the deputy director and chief engineer at the Detroit Water Department. Welcome, Palencia. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me uh, here to speak a little bit about the historic uh, rain of it that happened on June 25th uh, into June 26th of this year. Uh, throughout Southeast Michigan, uh, particularly areas uh, south of 94 and south of I-96, not just in the city of Detroit, uh, but you know, throughout Southeast Michigan, were inundated with a rainfall that in some instances exceeded seven inches uh, and in other instances was nearly eight inches of rain in a very short duration. Mm -hmm. There's some initial data that suggests the most, uh, the highest volume of rain fell in a three hour period that began at 11.30 p.m. on Friday evening and went to 2.30 a.m. on um, Saturday morning. And so there was approximately six inches that fell in that short time span. I can only speak for 
the regional system, uh, not the regional system, the local systems uh, and how we interact with the regional system, which is operated by Great Lakes Water Authority. I want to be clear, there's been a lot of miscommunication about who's responsible for what and who does what. The city of Detroit is responsible for the pipes that we have within the city, city boundaries that connect to the regional pipes, which are operated by Great Lakes Water Authority. Those regional pipes connect to pump stations and or wet weather treatment facilities um, or go to the wastewater waste recovery reclamation facility, wastewater. They changed the name. The simple name used to be wastewater treatment plant. So I have to um, think through it. Uh, and so they operate the facilities that provide treatment associated with sewage collection and wet weather flows, such as rainfall, runoff from rainfall. So I want to be clear that the regional authority uh, actually, you know, collects we all have inputs to that regional system. And then there, uh, from there, they operate the facilities that either treat, discharge, or, or discharge uh, waste uh, untreated if need be. Um, in a very, very large event such as this, uh, I'm sure you all recall maybe about two weeks ago, um, there were notifications around different beaches and not uh, attending uh, certain beaches. That's because many systems that were impacted by the wet weather had to discharge flows that were in excess of what, which means that were larger than what treatment facilities are designed to handle. So I'll be very honest in that this was something we had not seen before. This volume of rain was more rain than the 2014 event. And even the peak volume came down in a much shorter duration uh, than what we witnessed in 2014. Generally speaking, systems are designed to more or less these systems are designed to handle, let's say, two to three inches of rain in a day. Um, they are not designed to handle nine inches or seven to eight yeah, inches sure, in sure. a less than 24 hour period. So that, uh, you know, is the proximate cause um, you know, the main reason for flooding. There are some nuances that I'm sure occurred uh, depending on um, how parts of the system interact. But generally speaking, the weather event was much larger uh, than what systems are designed to handle. Yeah, um, you, you brought, I think you've kind of helped us better understand that there are some layers. So uh, that the Detroit uh, Water Department um, has uh, the responsibility for those pipes that are in the city, but then those feed into a regional entity. And just so we can be clear, because we know that there have been some changes structurally with the department, that regional entity, is the city of Detroit a part of that regional entity as well? We have member seats just like, uh, so when the city uh, filed for bankruptcy, one of the things that, uh, ended up happening is that the water of water department was reconstituted as right. a regional water authority and it is governed by a six member board mm -hmm. that board includes two members uh appointed by the city of detroit a member appointed by wayne county a member appointed by macomb county a member appointed by oakland county and a member appointed by the state of michigan and so that Great Lakes Water Authority, um, you know, does the work uh, associated with how the facilities, in essence, sure. provide service sure. um, to the region. So, you know, we had this rain event, um, and certainly, as you have made clear as an engineer, it was pretty unprecedented and, and just knocked out the capacity of the system. But given that, um, what are the resources, what's been the response What's, what have been the response and what are the resources available to, uh, to residents uh, who've been impacted by the flood? So first off, uh, let me say that we uh, are prioritizing assistance as the city of Detroit, not just DWSD, but as the city of Detroit uh, for seniors and those who are disabled. There is a volunteer core 
along with uh, members of the general services department and other contracted staff that specifically for those 65 and up who have, um, or those who may have a disability that need assistance removing debris from their homes, um, we're providing that service on, on that side. Um, and that is solely getting debris out of your home at this point. Uh, the next category of folks are those who are approved for the homeowner property tax assistance program, which means that these are homeowners who uh, meet income qualifications, are low income, uh, that can receive assistance with cleaning and sanitation of their resident, of their, uh, of their you know, impacted uh, resident, residences. And so that program also has the caveat that you have to be 65 and older and or disabled and or have children age 10 and under living in the home. Mm -hmm. So based on who's called us, we know what that universe um, of residents looks like and those uh, processes are beginning now. Um, so folks who have called do not need to uh, call again. Uh, we will be making contact with you um, as we go through uh, the process. Valentia, probably two more questions, if you would. So one, if you if you can, uh, before the end of the program or very shortly thereafter, if we could get the contact information, uh, a slide that has how people can make these connections, because even while those they're on the City of Detroit uh, website, not everyone is tech savvy to do that, and we always try to make sure that we get some of that information. But the other thing is, is that, um, so we had this unprecedented e event, um, and, but we also know we've gotten significant American Rescue Act dollars. In what way is the department uh, rethinking or being engaged with FEMA, new dollars to make sure that there's an infrastructure, particularly with climate change, that uh, gets us ready and can prevent this in the future? Because perhaps we should not be thinking this is as much an anomaly um, as, as it appears. So as engineers, um, you know, there was just a regional wastewater master plan created, I shouldn't say created, completed in June of 2020. And Great Lakes Water Authority had all of the member partners, that's what they call the customer communities that connect mm -hmm. uh, on, onto the system on the wastewater side, nonprofit uh, regulation, regulators from the Michigan Department um, of energy, of energy, Great Lakes and the environment. I mess it up, but yeah. Eagle. It's a um, right. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a cadre of partners that were in the room that wor worked through, well, what would the system need to look like and what do our individual systems need to look like to have success in the future? And I think, and we looked at climate change, you know, parameters. I think what is challenging, particularly about climate change, is that there's not a convergence of a lot of the data sets yet, and a lot of the models don't line up. Um, and so we do the same thing, right? We have to project based on data, right? That's what a model is, is trying to give you some estimate of what's happening. Well, we know from the June 25th, 26th event, every weather analysis, except for one, one, you know, that somebody brought up later um, that people use said that the Detroit area maybe was going to get two inches, right? This event was supposed to go above us and really kind of be more to the north. Not saying it would have impacted yeah. us some kind of way because it's all connected. Water doesn't know boundaries, particularly storm water, right? It's going to get to something my mother taught me long ago that I hear every time I think about doing something with work, water always seeks its lowest level. So it's always going to get to where it has to get. Um, and so we have looked at a variety of things, but even things we looked at now, this I, I changed. Yeah. Yeah, this changed it. And so there is going to have to be funding, you know, systems. If everybody that's a member partner in the Great Lakes water authority service area were to try to separate out their stormwater systems. And this is just only talking mostly about pipes. This is not even yeah. talking about the treatment that still could be sure. required. Well, Lucia, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, Cause you, you really are helping us understand the, the complexity of it. Um, and and I've, I've got my wonderful partners saying, Jamela, we're almost out of time. 
Um, so what I would like, again, if, if you could provide the information so that residents, business owners, et cetera, could know where these resources are to make those connections. And then just one last quick question. What is the, uh, the city's policy in terms of water shutoffs, given that we're still, still in COVID? And then we're going to hear from uh, Wayne Metro, which is our community action agency. Sure. Uh, to be clear, we will get that information over to you with some of the links of the information I've spoken about. Uh, but the and our PR team will get that to you uh, before end of day. Uh, but with respect to water service interruptions, we're still, you know, following the orders that have been uh, issued. We do not have water service interruptions uh, for residential customers um, in light of, you know, the COVID situation. So water service interruptions have been suspended, um, you know, in light of what happened with respect to COVID-19. Okay, good. Thank you. And it was also a, a pleasure to have um, you share some perspectives from engineering, because sometimes people don't, don't think of that. But uh, we let the community know that there are resources, the city is moving on it. And maybe just a little bit different, you know, we know that you're working on it, but people are still going to call because people still have these huge needs. And, and that's a good segue to ask uh, Heba if you would uh, join us from, from Wayne Metro. Thank you, Clemencia. Wayne Thank Metro, you for having uh, me. You guys have been providing resources for all types of critical basic needs. Tell us real specifically what's available to residents and businesses, community-based programs, churches that have found themselves flooded, have mold, et cetera. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jametta, for having me on this call. I know many of you guys are familiar with me. I am Hiba Hidus. I'm the Assistant Director with Community Engagement and Outreach at Wayne Metro. For those who are not familiar, Wayne Metro is a nonprofit human service agency that provides needs driven and holistic assistance to indiv individuals and families. Our goal actually is to ensure great quality, healthier homes, and we want those thriving communities. We have over 75 programs and services that we can that we offer. Um, our website, I will make sure to send you a slide to meta of our website, our phone number and contact information. But in the meantime, our website is www.waymetro.org. And our contact information, our phone number is 313-388-9799. So Translating, we were talking about the floods. I just want to mention what Wayne, how Wayne Metro is taking action. So Wayne Metro Community Action Agency has actually been working alongside local leaders and organizations to support residents who experienced flooding due to the rain event on June 25 and June 26. Southwest Michigan got hit sadly. I was actually one of those residents. Mm -hmm. um, so were my parents down the street, my uncles, my aunts, my friends, my neighbors, um, you know, the senior citizen that lives right next door to me. Um, so this, it, you know, I, I knew that Wayne Metro was going to take some type of action and we did. So Wayne Metro was able to dispatch a PAC team that is projects for assistance in transition for homelessness. So if a client needed immediate relocation, um, Wayne Metro is able to help relocate residents okay. to temporary emergency housing or help um, while their home is being cleaned up. So at the same time, we're in full speed. The agency is also accepting applications for emergency food and supplies and rent and utility assistance along with those property tax and income tax. Wayne Metro is also accepting applications for the Great Lakes Water Authority, our RAP program, which is our water residential assistance program that provides eligible residents in the Great Lakes Water Authority service area with payment assistance and home water conservation services. So RAP, this program, has actually just recently gone through a program design change. So I got good news. We were able to pay up to $700 in past dues. July 1st of 2021, so two weeks ago, 
we have increased that cap to $1,200. So any clients that are behind on their water bills up to $1,200 and are a opted in community for this program are able to apply for these services. Um, so I want everybody to take advantage. Our actually, our website is going through a, uh, is going to be updating this information within the next couple weeks. And we are working currently on a flyer with these new program design changes for the water residential assistance program. Okay. Um, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so I just wanted to, um, so it's wonderful about the, the additional dollars and so there's housing that is available. Are, are there resources that uh, Wayne Metro is able to provide for repair, uh, mold, uh, abatement, things of that nature? So we, are, um, we have our weatherization program, um, which helps with those minor plumbing repairs, but not in, in extent um, to those. We are still looking for those dollars to come in um, where okay. we can assist clients. But I will definitely share our weatherization flyer to see if that's applicable for any, you know, those questions that clients may have. Okay, great. Are there any other pieces of information? Um, if you could repeat the telephone number. For yes, the phone number is, yes, the th the, our, our contact or connect center. Um, ours are Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we are also open on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And our phone number is 313-388-9799. Um, so you can give us a call. You can even, we have a chat feature on our website um, or you can email the Connect Center. Um, I also wanna just, you know, talk briefly. Um, we have our, um, we're, we're still in full speed with our SARA program, which is the COVID emergency rental assistance. So we are still assisting those renters that are behind on their rent. Renters can be eligible for up to 12 months um, and three months forward rent. And then I lastly, I know we're cutting time short, um, but way much of just has so many programs. Um, yeah. We still have our, our free tax preparation program that you can apply for tax preparation services all year round. And again, the word key is free. Um, so with this, I want to talk about just briefly the child tax credit and the American Rescue Plan that provides the largest child tax credit ever. Um, for working families and most families were automatically receive these monthly payments without having to take action. Um, please reach out to Wayne Metro so they can apply for those taxes for you. Um, so you can see if you're eligible for this, for this funding. Families can be eligible for $3,000 per child that they have that they're claiming from six years to 17 years old. And then even the children that are under six, they can be eligible for $3,600 as well. Yes, thank you. These are phenomenal resources. Again, community, please call on Wayne Metro. You can go to the website and just as he said, uh, you can chat and someone will help you. Uh, and then if you need help, the, the city of Detroit will make that information available for you as well because we're here to provide resources to help our community stay safe, stay strong. Uh, Christine, I'm gonna pass it to you. Um, it looks like we've had a phenomenal uh, amount of input today. We did. Um, I just have, I have one question for Ms. Mobley, if she could come back on. Um, and if there's, any, if there's any update on when or if FEMA, mo FEMA money will be approved to help families who've been impacted by the floods. So I don't know if. So perhaps that's a follow-up question. Um, sure. Nancy was saying that she's gonna get some of these other contact information to us. And of course, FEMA provides information to uh, folks on the ground. 
and to the systems to help them do a better job helping us. So great Absolutely. question. Forgot to put that one in there, uh, Christine. Thanks. All right. And then um, and then Hiba, does does Wayne Metro have a, a bilingual line? Yes, they do. We actually have been hiring bilingual staff too, Spanish and Arabic speaking. Um, and then there's an option. Our website is also translated into those various uh, languages as well. Okay, so if folks call Wayne Metro, they they press one and they can get to translation. Is yep. that okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I think that that is all for today um what a what great information and i'm really excited about um about the the information that the water department is going to send us so that we can better understand um what was you know how we what's going to happen going forward as it relates to flooding so um just a couple of announcements. Uh, we've got the community voting tool from 482 Forward. Um, so we still, that tool is still live and we'd love for all of you to tell us what you want to see um, done with all of the stimulus dollars that are coming down from the federal government and into the state of Michigan, how you see those, those dollars those dollars being spent in schools. Um, and, and then also for flood remediation. So if you've been, if you've experienced, um, if you experienced flooding, uh, we're putting a link in the chat right now uh, of where you can go and, and get help for, um, uh, for, for damages from the flooding. So this looks like it's for damage, uh, for claims related to the damage. Just a reminder that uh, if you're in Detroit, the different neighborhood um, managers, Department of Neighborhoods and the managers, I know that there's cleaning supplies that are available right now. So if you need help with cleaning supplies, that seems to be a theme for 2020 and 2021. <laughs> Is the need for extra cleaning supplies. The city is also um, distributing those, I think through their departments of neighborhoods. So, um, so if you need help, please reach out and, uh, and so that you can, you can uh, clean up after these, uh, the terrible flooding that happened at the end of June. Uh, we wanna remind everybody um, to stay powerful, stay healthy, Get vaccinated. <laughs> uh, so if everybody could turn on their cameras as we say goodbye, we'll see y'all next week on Thursday. It's been nice to have Dr. Fuller back and some familiar faces. So everyone have a wonderful, wonderful Thursday afternoon. Stay healthy, stay powerful, stay informed. See y'all later. Yes, we can do this, Detroit. Stay blessed.